Yes, welcome to the Hypothesis Social Learning Summit. Um, this is a session titled The Latest Research on Social Annotation and Social Reading. Um, first of all, the session is being recorded, um, so folks are aware of that, and also so people who cannot join us live will be able to access um, the presentations and the discussion following today's session. Um, if you're using the AirMeet platform for the first time, please know that there are a few features similar to Zoom, which I think many people are using um, pretty frequently these days. There is a chat, and you're very welcome to use the chat to say hi, perhaps tell us where you're joining from, maybe what you do professionally, and also to use the chat for general banter throughout today's session. There is also a dedicated question and answer or Q&A feature that you'll see here in AirMeet. I'll mention this again. And as we hear from our featured guests today, and as we move deeper in today's session, if you do have questions um, for either of our guests or for both or for me or for the panel in general, please do use the Q&A feature so we can bring your questions um, up. So let me introduce myself briefly. Um, my name is Rami Khalir. I'm an associate professor of learning, design, and technology at the University of Colorado in Denver. And I'd like to begin my brief remarks this morning um, with a land and labor acknowledgement. Um, though we are, of course, gathered here in a digital space, we all occupy various places that have rich, if not quite complex histories. And I join you from the ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Ute people, otherwise known today as Denver, Colorado. And I also want to recognize the labor um, that is a very much a part of what brings us together today in this moment. I want to first begin with um, folks at Hypothesis who have really helped to make today's event possible. That includes Wendy Morgan uh, for all of her work or organizing speakers and, and, and logistics. Um, Matt Dricker is here today behind the scenes, um, helping with some tech, um, as is Aaron Barker. And I also want to recognize the folks whose labor, perhaps with our families, um, like my spouse, makes my time and presence possible today as well. Um, so many people make our participation possible, and that labor um, must be recognized as well. Um, let me also mention that for some of you who are joining us for the, uh, you know, this type of session for the first time, you may know a little bit about me. Um, during the 2020-2021 academic year, I served as a scholar in residence at Hypothesis, um, and much of my scholarship and public writing uh, and advocacy concerns social annotation, and it's really an honor to be invited back to moderate today's session uh, with really two very dear friends and colleagues. And I'm so excited to introduce them to you in just a moment. I'll just briefly mention the kind of outline of today's schedule uh, or today's session. Um, I'll again introduce um, our two guests. We'll then hear their presentations about 10 to 15 minutes each. And then following their presentations, um, I'll ask a few general questions to them both. We'll, of course, also be eliciting, again, Q&A from all of you, our participants, and let the conversation evolve over the course of the next 60, 75, 90 minutes. We'll see how things go. Um, so that's the general outline. Again, there is a chat. And again, there's a, a Q&A feature here. Um, so let me begin with a few introductions. Um, and the first is to my dear uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Sharice McBride. Um, Dr. McBride is a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Berkeley School of Education, where she works on the Writing Data Stories Project. It's an effort to teach data literacy through storytelling. Her current work is supported by the George Lucas Educational Foundation with a focus on equity-centered learning environments. In addition to that role, she also serves as a scholar at large for YR Media, formerly Youth Radio, which is a long-standing Bay Area organization dedicated to empowering youth journalists. And there, she researches youth cultural belonging and teachers development of humanizing digital media curriculum. Dr. McBride is also a former high school English teacher and has coached teachers and higher education faculty across a range of content and educational settings. Now, I have known Dr. McBride for quite a few years now. I was actually looking for the first date of our presentation together at AERA, and I actually couldn't find it. I have to admit, it was <laughs> too many years ago, and I just couldn't quite dig it out of my CV somewhere. Um, I primarily have collaborated with Dr. McBride through our work together on the Marginal Syllabus Project, which is an effort that uses social annotation, and specifically hypothesis, to invest educators in discussions about equity-oriented literacy education. And in that capacity, Dr. McBride and I have led the project. We have presented together. 
We have researched and written together. We've done quite a lot of work over the years, and it's just an honor now to see her related research grow in a variety of ways and to present some of that work to all of you today. So Dr. Shreese McBride, you're so very welcome. Um, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Hodgson briefly, and then we'll jump back to your presentation, okay? Um, so today we're also um, honored to be joined by Dr. Justin Hodgson. Um, he is an associate professor of digital rhetoric and the coordinator of online first year composition at IU Bloomington. He's also the founding editor of the Journal for Undergraduates Multimedia Projects and serves as a global digital literacy thought leader for Adobe. He's an award-winning teacher and digital rhetoric scholar whose research concerns the intersections of rhetoric, technology, play and games, digital pedagogy, and culture. His 2019 open access monograph titled Post-Digital Rhetoric and the New Aesthetic was published with Ohio State University Press. Most recently, he's helped to create and lead the Digital Gardener Initiative at Indiana University, which is a digital literacy initiative focused on student engagement and faculty development across all of IU's seven campuses and two regional centers. I began to collaborate with Dr. Hodgson a few years ago now in my capacity as scholar in residence at Hypothesis. Uh, we quickly hit it off, um, quickly became dear friends, and have now been deep in data, deep in writing, leading a team together that has just been quite a lot of fun. And so there really are no better folks to talk with us today about the state of social annotation research uh, to ask important questions that are both critical and creative, to look both broadly at scale, but deeply at intimate practice, and to think about how across both K-12 and higher education contexts, social annotation is really making a difference in learners' lives and in learners' literacies. And so with that long and very deserved introduction to both of our extremely distinguished guests, Dr. McBride, welcome. It's so good to see you. Um, Thank you so much. The floor is, the floor is, the floor is yours. Great. It's always a pleasure to um, be in conversation with you, Ramey, and your colleagues. You always bring such great people together, um, including those in the audience. I'm so happy to see so many of you joining us this morning. Or for me, it's morning. I'm joining from the beautiful Bay Area, San Francisco uh, Bay Area, specifically in Oakland, uh, the land of the Ohlone people um, in particular. And um, yeah, I will go ahead and jump right into it. Let's get my screen shared. Okay, great. So as Ramey um, shared, my name is Sharice McBride and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Berkeley School of Education. We recently changed our name from the Graduate School of Education. Um, and today I'm excited to talk to you about social annotation research, particularly as rooted in teacher learning and what kinds of impact we're seeing in teacher learning. And this will all be connected to this frame of justice oriented media literacies that's been an important part of my work in recent times. Um, and this is in, in light of my work with teachers and youth. So <clears throat> the I, I wanna start by saying that social annotation has become especially compelling to me as I'm interested in socioculturally situated learning, um, meaning that I recognize learning, again, particularly teacher learning, as something that often happens in community and in, in culture. So in my own former work as a high school teacher and as a continuing lecturer um, from community college across to graduate school levels, I recognize that teaching is indeed a public act. Um, it's one that requires a great deal of collaboration, inquiry, um, as, as teachers continue to refine their practice. So when I think about teacher learning, especially in a digitally mediated society, I think it's important for us to take up using technology in authentic ways that really support teacher learning, both their own and that of each other. So um, as a side note, much of my work has been in participatory networks of teachers or social media use and how they learn together online. But another key part of my interest is in training teachers to use technology. And that's where I think social annotation is really useful in that it, order, um, it offers sort of a situated ed tech practice um, it's an opportunity for teachers to use technology toward authentic ends, including their own learning. And then through that process, they're continuing to build their repertoires of practice with technology, whether that's learning new affordances or developing specific connections to teaching and professional learning. 
Um, and then all these together, of course, promote new literacies. As a literacy scholar, I'm always concerned with how folks are engaging different ways of speaking and listening and writing in ways that are particularly connected and social and multimodal. Um, and, and multimodal in the sense that they're involving the creation and consumption of a variety of text types across words, you know, highlights, colors, images, sounds, videos, all sorts of uh, different modes of meaning making. Uh, so with that framing of the importance of emplacement of social annotation in that cycle of teacher learning, what I want to focus on today is work that I've done that um, comes from work with secondary and college educators. Um, specifically in this example that I'll be sharing today, I've worked with teachers who have been teaching a variety of subjects, um, including history, English, media literacy explicitly. Um, and through these experiences, my focus is always on making thinking visible, right? Again, touching on that frame of learning in public, my approach to professional development, to curriculum development is one that really opens avenues for sharing and for really what becomes taking risks together um, and engaging multiple forms of media. So these values and commitments, of course, are central to my practice and specifically in my practice as a teacher educator. And I also seek to honor the lived experiences of teachers, as I said, how they're learning organically. So this construct of, uh, oops, excuse me, justice oriented media literacies is, is one effort to really um, encourage and push teachers thinking and practice in ways that really center justice. And of course, I think that's important considering the history of dehumanization and oppression in schools, which really have served to subordinate um, certain experiences or cultures and perspectives to those of the dominant culture and perspectives. And so this concept, justice-oriented media literacy, intentionally makes room for those subordinated voices and contributions to be made visible. And that's, of course, an example, as Ramey was sharing, the marginal syllabus. Um, this is an example of bringing the margins to the center. Um, and the other thing about justice-oriented media literacy is kind of a mouthful, Jamal, <laughs> um, is that they're rooted in digital meaning making, digital technology. And this is specifically from the frame of critical reading and composition with digital tools. We're, we're thinking about how media exists as artifacts of learning. Um, and finally, I've, I've intentionally grounded this as a curricular framework, rooting it in practice. I think it's really important, of course, for us to connect theory to practice. And this frame allows um, concrete building blocks, as we call them, for considering specifically authorship and commentary in a digital context. So I'm going to turn now to this the framework. Um, and this concept, again, is really rooted in authorship. You'll see that at the forefront of the model. Um, Authorship is, to me, a way to consider who gets to make meaning, who gets to construct knowledge. Um, and we'll, we see how often in our historical understandings of the author, the author has become this like codified, legitimated voice um, in meaning making. But often authors in traditional classroom, classrooms, especially in textbooks, um, are kind of this objective, in some ways, above questioning um, entity and in and, and this construct of justice oriented media literacy, I intentionally push against that to, to think about the author as a function that's open to students and it's a space where they're able to express their voices to create and compose. So, um, and then also with that is unpacking the authorship of texts and, and unpacking the authorship, who wrote this, what, what might be some of those motivations. And that's where the media literacy is um, kind of takes front, front and center. <clears throat> Um, so that's, as I was saying, authorship. Now, moving from authorship to thinking about commentary and annotation is really important for us to interrogate, like, what does an author do? And this is where I really appreciate uh, Rami Collier and, and Antero Garcia's reflections on, on commentary and particularly annotation as commentary. That's one of the functions of, of, of annotation. <clears throat> so what this means is that given so much user generated content that we see in our world today, commentary or the space to, to do these functions down at the bottom here really becomes accessible and, and something that we can all do. Um, I love how they call it an egalitarian affair, um, this idea that anyone can comment on anything almost anywhere. And with that, I also appreciate that annotation is not restricted to written text or print text. Rather, almost anything can be annotation, whether we're talking about graffiti or perhaps posting comments on social media. 
So all of these serve as, as chances to categorize information, to react to information, um, correct inaccuracies, which I think is really important in the frame in the uh, pursuit of justice. And these are some of my favorites, um, but there are tons on this list. Um, so now that act of when we look at commentary, um, th it's something that this framework invites. And again, inviting youth to be authors and opportunities to annotate texts themselves, their worlds. And, and with that, that's where text pairings become really important as we consider what are our youth's voices being put in conversation with? Um, how are youth texts even being elevated to that level of um, being paired with canonical texts in, in, in conversation? So all of these are questions that I invite educators to consider through the work that, um, that we do together. I'll be running another series of workshops this summer through a partnership with Wire Media and the Bay Area Writing Project, which is where I kind of come out of. Um, and and these are these are all rooted in um, how our students are becoming authors, and how they're they're all this together really um, it addresses digital technology and content standards that we aim to not only meet but exceed. And and I won't be going so much into that today, but I really want to emphasize how these three commentary and annotation, text pairings, and authorship work together. So. Um, if you're interested to learn more, you can take a look at our article, which is coming out soon in the Education Leadership Quarterly. It'll be out this year, later this year. Um, but what I want to do now for the rest of the little time that I have is to turn our attention specifically to the actual annotations and texts that teachers are um, have worked through. Now, what's interesting is this is directly from the YR Media site. If you go to yr.media, there's tons of um, youth created media that has been shared not only here but even through other outlets including NPR and local news radio stations um, as well as other websites and podcasts um, and I think this will give us an opportunity to see the inner workings of social annotation in action so this particular artifact is an article um, multimedia article that was created by a youth um, participant named Kiera Fraser. Again, this person works with YR Media. And this article is about a youth media organization, uh, I'm sorry, not a media, a youth mental health organization that was started by a young person named Diana Chow when she was a teenager that um, really responds to issues of, of mental illness uh, among her peer group, as well as things that she had experienced herself. So in this example, you'll see the art, the artifact itself, and this is a web page. Um, and then to the right, you'll see our Anna. Oops, I just clicked the web page. Um, I'll go ahead and let you take a look at it. <clears throat> so this is this is kind of what the YR site looks like, and you'll see these different news verticals. Um, and this one I think was in the health uh, section. And so these yellow um, highlights are things that the teachers and the YR group have commented on. And my goal here was to give them a chance to to learn from youth media, learn from, build from uh, youth voice. And so here you'll see, um, I wanna zoom in on this conversation that's happening in the margins among teachers. Now, I, um, these, these are all put together also by students who are ages about 14 to 25, just to clarify what youth means in this context. Um, so what I really appreciate is that it offers a potential mentor text for our students, but also content for teachers to learn and discuss. Um, and so if, if you see here, I'm happy to answer any questions about the logistics of this space, but um, you'll see, oops, I keep clicking that on accident, sorry about that. Okay, you'll see here, um, one of the teachers highlights how after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder at 13, Diana realizes the importance of advocating for mental health. And so this teacher's note here is, I wonder how the article, um, the author of this article heard about, heard about this. So as I look at it, he's already taking a step back and particularly focusing on authorship and where, um, how this youth author is, has put this, this piece together. Um, and then here we see another annotation that I think highlights um, how as a first generation Chinese American, Diana encountered stigma related to mental illness and she wanted to fix it. And so one of the teacher's comments is around, um, I wonder if this stigma is something she's feeling within the Chinese American community.
<clears throat> Did we lose her? I think we may have just lost Trace for a moment. While she reconnects, I'm going to just say that I've got a whole page full of notes here. Um, and for folks who perhaps are following along, I'm, again, pretty familiar with, with, with Dr. McBride's work, but the flipping of the script here is actually something that I had um, forgotten a little bit about and I think is really quite fascinating that we have here a case of educators learning through social annotation as they read texts written by youth. And I think that that's um, in and of itself a rather fascinating dynamic. And I know that, you know, we'll hear from Dr. Hodgson in a moment about a more, dare we say, conventional, although equally important learning environment, let's say undergraduates who are learning how to read and write at the university level, very important. Um, and one of the reasons why I find Dr. McBride's work so compelling um, is because we are seeing here designs for, in this case, professional learning that take advantage of the affordances of hypothesis in this case and social annotation more broadly and really invert expectations around authorship, as she was mentioning, and voice, whose expertise is worthy of study, and then how educators themselves are the ones making meaning of these narratives, which in the case that she was just showing is an example of you know, youth mental health, which is of course a pretty pretty pressing topic these days. And so um, I find this to be again, really quite um, fascinating work. And while she's again rejoining, I wanna just again orient people back to the chat. Um, it looks as though we have actually a link to the artifact that she was just sharing, um, which of course is annotated, although I, I'm not sure if those annotations are public or they may be private to a group that she was working with. And again, yeah, the Q&A function is, yeah, the Q&A function is also available if folks want to drop a question into the mix at this point in anticipation of her rejoining us or if, if we want to just um, kind of pivot, but happy to hold the floor for a moment here and hopefully we can resolve the tech issues in just a, in just a moment. I can also elicit from no public annotation. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Mo, good no to see you here. Glad to hear. Looks like we're going to have to have uh, Dr. McBride join us. Um, and while she does so, happy to again address any questions, comments in the chat, or if I could just put you on the spot, Dr. Hodgson, <laughs> um, quick, quick reactions or quick thoughts to kind of getting a glimpse of of that approach to work, particularly in light of your experiences, you know, using social annotation in a very different learning environment, in a very different learning context. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's um, it's a fascinating way of thinking about, uh, on, on one level, just you know, sort of data collection, right? Like as a researcher, as a scholar, as somebody who's interested in things and, and making inquiry and in as an inquiry practice um, uh, of, you know, different kinds of groups in the world, if you have students who are writing things up, you can then collectively and collectively analyzing that work through this tool, it's a, it's a new way of thinking about um, how we go about the kind of, kind of legwork of doing the scholarship, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm fascinated by that because I never thought about using the tool for re, for research itself, but rather researching the tool and its application. So I'm on the I'm on the other side of that uh, split. Um, but it, it does. I mean, of course, there's all kinds of wonderful things that come out of that, and 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 other kinds of concerns too, like you know how to get access to groups and student content, especially if they're under 18 and those kind of things. But um, the general principle of making an inquiry. Uh, and thinking through the inquiry on the text uh, of young writers, especially as someone who teaches writing, you know, um, it's a it's an interesting area up there that could be opened up. Uh, Madeline yeah. from Queensboro Community College says, "How do you communicate with the ESL students?" That's a really good question. In terms of like in class or you, in the annotations? Yeah, well, Madeline, let me yeah. say that um, if you're learning about social annotation here for the first time or seeing examples like this, um, you know, students can read and write in you know any language that they choose including whether they're using hypothesis or any other you know various technologies um and so you know google docs can be written in lots of different languages um, um you know so uh, chats see, can I'm be written in a lot of different languages so i guess i'm just like hypothesis is equally language inclusive in that respect and we had a really lovely calm presentation i guess maybe last year about specific world language use cases of hypothesis with educators from Mexico talking about their students who are online in Peru and an Italian educator living in Korea doing all kinds of different, you know, second language work. There've been some really interesting 
published um, scholarly pieces about English language learning in Japanese contexts recently as well. And so I think that you know a tool that affords, as Dr. McBride was saying, um, socially mediated meaning making need not be specific to a given language. Yeah, and I was just going to add that like, um, you know, so I have colleagues who are like lexographers or they study like word etymology. Uh, and on the one hand, you, you, you know, this kind of thing offers a really fascinating way of like in text arguing those things through. But uh, a colleague of mine in, in linguistics who uh, teaches sort of travel narratives and things, as, as I'm trying to get him to use this to talk about translation activities, right? Yeah. Here's the text, here's the translations, and, and, and to embed some of those conversations. It's not a straight ESL kind of conversation like we have in, in composition, but um, but I think the, the possibilities are really fascinating if you, yeah. you know, it's the it? construct yeah. well. So just a quick a session update, just to jump meta for a moment here. I just got a text from, from Cherie saying, hey, I just lost my internet. So of course, uh, this is of course the challenges of living and learning and teaching in these, yet again, digital spaces where we take affordances for granted and, and things pop up. Um, let me just say, Madeline, in response to your question, very again briefly, that there is just again, a really long history of the use of social annotation, again, generally speaking, um, used in language learning contexts. And so if you're looking for particular um, research articles, strategies, whatever it may be, you know, connect with the hypothesis folks. We have a public um, Zotero bibliography that includes some of those citations, and you can definitely get access to some of those resources and that might, might help you as well. Um, so I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed that Dr. McBride jumps back in and joins us, but for the sake of just keeping things moving along, we're gonna just mix it up. So Dr. Hodgson, let's jump in, let's run through what you're talking about, and then we may jump back into Dr. McBride's work and we'll just kind of follow the associative trails as they may be, given that we're talking about annotation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll just annotate our way through today. Um, a real quick acknowledgement on my end, you know, the, uh, I'm an IU Bloomington campus, and so I'm and I'm joining today from the lands of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people who are the past, present, and future caretakers of, of this wonderful space that I get to call home, um, and then the campus that I, I get to work on. And so I appreciate, you know, those kind of acknowledgements as we get started. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different uh, approach, uh, you know, cause it's not, I'm not gonna get too much into the weeds as far as like analysis uh, of, of um, specific uh, annotations. We're gonna talk much more broad scale, but let me share my screen and kind of get us started a little bit so you can see something other than my face. Uh, select tab. I like to narrate as I go, you know, so that's one of my, uh... all right, am I, am I sharing? Hey, there we go. Uh, social annotation at scale. And to make this easier for you all, I'm going to actually, this is created in uh, an Adobe Express uh, web page, the Adobe Creative Cloud Express web page. And so it is live online. You can access it. There's not a lot of content here, but the images I'm going to show, especially as we get to some of the uh, the finer details will be um, <laughs> a little hard to see on the screen. So just easier if you can access it when we get to that point. So I think it's important to understand a little bit uh, the difference here. So uh, while Dr. McBride is looking at specifically use cases in a, in a sort of focused way. Um, sort of my journey is more of um, what happens when you employ social annotation at, at a programmatic level of scale. And uh, what this means is we decided for various reasons, and I'll, I'll give you the backstory, but we decided uh, to include uh, hypothesis into our first year accomplishing curriculum. Uh, and then with the pandemic, eventually it's, it rolled out to being used in every single one of our first year accomplishing courses, in addition to several of our 200 level uh, literature courses. And so, um, but to understand that you have to understand like the process, because I think it's important to, to put in context. So I built our first ever online uh, accomplishing class in 2014, led a team to do this. And then, you know, uh, and it worked great. It was like a learning commons model, where we used advanced instructors to teach. Yeah, uh, you want me to stop or you want me to let it go? Uh, Rami, what do you want to do? Your call, man, you're the host. Oh, I don't know. Hey, hey, sure. Apologies for the tech difficulties. We actually just had a lovely little sidebar about all kinds of stuff. Um, but given that you're back, hope everything is okay. I was just saying like how fickle everyone's internets are these days, so. That has never happened to me. I just cut off completely. It was, it was like, um, oh, hey, where'd you go? Um, I think I'm if it's so okay, since, please yeah, don't apologize. Just started, but... Please don't apologize. Justin was literally just getting started. And I think for the sake of kind of narrative flow, let's just pick up where you were and then we'll kind of go back. And hey, folks, thanks for hanging with us. But you know what? such as life when we're bringing folks together across the country here in this space, making things happen. So Sharice, it's all good. Take it away. 
We're here. We're here. Do you? I thought I was almost at the end. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the invitation. Sounds like we may be having a slight bit of, of delay on your end still. Just a slight. We're having just a, a little bit of a bandwidth issue, perhaps. Oh, all right. I guess you all can hear me. Let's. We can hear you. It's just broken up a lot, Sharice. Um, maybe stop the video for audio. Are you talking to me or her? <laughs> I think she can hear this, man. Uh, I can see, you can just see that her, um, her Wi-Fi signal, her strength of, of this, uh, is, is really short. So, and she's all right. Got, uh, all right. Well, I think that? folks, unfortunately we're, we're, we're juggling some tech issues. So Dustin, let's, let's, let's take along. Um, and and then hopefully we'll just kind of pick up and move through uh as best we can yeah hold on it's letting me uh toggle my things back on and there it goes perfect <clears throat> okay so um let me see where i was at uh how we get here right so um we had a successful online model that worked primarily for teaching with advanced instructors then in uh right before the pandemic the fall before the pandemic the college asked us to uh, to try and scale it we were only offering like six sections to eight sections a semester and they wanted to offer more closer to like 15 to 20. but to do that we had to redesign the course to make it work for people who were less advanced um, and particularly maybe had no experience teaching online um, or little experience teaching online and so uh, as we started that process there were two things we wanted to fix from the previous model that we wanted to improve the, the previous model was was fantastic and scored off the charts in our course evals so especially for online uh, as far as online learning goes, uh, and our drop rate was only like 10%, which is way below the uh, national average. Um, and, but we we had some things we wanted to fix. And, and one of those was um, we were really good at creating meaningful feedback loops between instructors and students, but our peer-to-peer -peer engagement wasn't quite as strong as it could be. And, and as a writing class, building community and having that kind of student-to-student -student connection um, and that, modeling, that shared modeling of inquiry is really kind of essential to what we want to do. So we, had, we knew we had to fix that. And two, we, we wanted to try and improve the way students engage with their course readings. Uh, and so, you know, I reached out to Jeremy Dean at Hypothesis because I had seen some work on, on social annotation and knew their tool a little bit. Because I also, the folks who I knew had said, you know, this is really good at doing these two things. So we tried to find a way to bring it into our new model um, to situate it in the context. And uh, uh, luckily we did this before the pandemic hit. And so then as the pandemic hit, our entire model shifted, where now we had to redesign our online course for um, every kind of instructor. Not only people new to teaching online, but people new to teaching. I never taught before. So we needed a lot more scaffolding, a lot more um, <clears throat> like, you know, sort of um, structural elements. Um, and we built a model uh, that would work initially, we, uh, intentionally we built a model that would work both completely online uh, or in the classroom or in hybrid modalities, because we decided early in the pandemic, uh, probably by the end of March, that we were just going to go fully online with our writing program the next year. Um, but if we had to flip it back and forth, we wanted that flexibility. So the, the long winded version of this is or the short version. Of this is uh, our online model that my team was building, which was centralized around including hypothesis, became the model for all 55 to 65 sections of 131 every semester. Um, and as a result of that, we we quickly realized that um, we were going to have uh, 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 just a, a, an enormous amount of data available to us because of the role that I occupy as a program uh, sort of supervisor and the fact that I'm the one pushing out the course models. And, and we partnered with the folks at Hypothesis to see if we could get access to the social annotation data. And that's when I met Ramey and we've kind of gone uphill and downhill ever since then. Right. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> as a fun, as a fun uh, weaving uh, process. And so some of you may be familiar with this, but we've had this uh, conversation a couple of times um, at different events. 
Uh, but it's important to know that context because our, our course design was intentional around improving student to student engagement and improving student engagement with text. And it just so happens that we have five core course readings a semester that students can now get now get to annotate um, and, and engage with one another. And so that's sort of the premise. We've been collecting data officially for three semesters, running this as a program for four. Uh, and next year will be our, 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 our third year if you go through this um, uh, cycle. So yeah, four semesters of data work so far. Um, and it's taken us just about this long to get to a point where we can get into making inquiries of the data because it's just so much. And, and to give you some perspectives here a little bit um, of how this works, and again, I'll click on this, you can see a little bit better. Um, basically every semester we run 50 to 65 sections of W131. There are on average between 1,100 and 1,500 students per semester. And then in each one of these 131 courses, these first year composition courses, there are five core readings, um, uh, five core, core course readings that students have to annotate. And each of those students have to annotate, have to have five annotations per, re, per, per reading. Of those five, three are additive uh, and two are responsive, or they make three original posts and then they, they reply uh, or engage in conversation on two other their posts. And to the, yeah, to the question in the chat, a hypothesis is used through our Canvas LMS. Um, and it's just part of our blueprint model that I, I have our course shell and I push it out to all the courses and then they uh, work with it uh, from there. Um, and so we've been getting, we get started gathering data in spring 21. We have 21 data in place we've been working with. We have collected uh, the fall 21 data, though we haven't worked with it yet. Uh, and we are in the process of collecting the spring 22 data. Um, but each iteration gets gets worse, as it were, <laughs> in terms of the number of, of things we're trying to deal with. Um, but to, to give you some sense, we collect not only the social annotation data from the course, um, but we pull out uh, as much data from Canvas as we can that's relative to assessing student performance in, in, in the writing program um, and in particular in relationship to the social annotation activity. So we, uh, you know, we, we collect their, the course writing assignments. We collect small activities. We can collect the feedback loops from instructors and the comments they provide. We collect uh, grade grades and individual assignments. We collect outputs on um, the course course outcomes to try and figure out um, is there any correlation and what 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 kind of correlations can we determine? And then uh, hopefully one day move further into looking at what role does the annotation activity play in impacting student level of writing? That's sort of one goal. We also wanna look closely at at how social annotation, the social part is, is, is being enacted. And so this is our, our kind of data set. If you think about spring 21, um, we collected data from our, from a series of literature courses as well um, that we call them the L2OXs, and it's like introduction to poetry, introduction to fiction. Um, but for purposes of what I'm sharing today, we've separated them out because they have a different curriculum and they annotate extremely uh, in higher volumes than, than we do. And it's not consistently the same curriculum from course to course. It is, you know, one, one instructor's L204 is a little bit different than the other instructor's L204. So um, to give you some sense here, we got 51 course sections in our fall, our spring 21 data that had 163 or 1,063 students enrolled uh, in those courses. Um, of those 976 annotated at least one text. And that was across 79 unique texts uh, of, of, that the, of across the, the different courses. Um, further within that, if, if you're curious, uh, at least 23 of the courses, um, what's that say? Uh, there were more than three texts or three texts shared in at least 23 of the courses. Um, and four courses had um, four courses had the same set of readings in more than ten sections. So it's you know it's a uh, or four readings had the same same involvement in sections across uh, ten different classes. And so there's just an incredible layering of information that we're trying to process because these readings come in different times, different places. And so that's the scope, that's the scale of what we're talking about today. Um, and I'm happy to go into a little more detail about the actual uh, content itself, but. Um, I wanted to give you the frame before we hop into maybe some of the things we're, what we're learning lately. Uh, and so we spent our first couple semesters looking basically at descriptive data and more recently have gotten into now trying to make sense of that descriptive data so that we can start to make um, inquiries of the text and sub inquiries of the text. Um, ah, so uh, real quick, I see Madeline's question. Here. Is there a word limit in the discussion boards? Um, we do not have a word limit, uh, a, um, a word limit. We do have a word minimum, uh, usually. No, we don't. We have, in some cases, we prompt for longer writing uh, engagements, but um, we, we try to eliminate, uh, yes, that's great comment, Ramey, right? <laughs> right? We try to eliminate those kind of um, empty ones, um, but it, it fluctuates a little bit further for us, uh, depending on the course and the, and the concepts that are being introduced. 
So what, what we come up with is to try and think of how do the, the annotations work across uh, all of these 131 sections and across the semester. And as you can see, there are clearly five course readings during the semester, uh, and they fall around these particular dates uh, on, on the calendar. Um, and what you're looking at here is the blue lines are the number of original posts um, on a daily uh, sort of count, and the, the orange line is the number of reply posts on a daily count across our entire 51 sections of, of spring 21 uh, data. And so you can see the, the windows and when the course is being, the reading is being discussed. I'm just gonna move through a little bit so you can see. Um, and one of the things we thought would be fascinating to figure out is, is there a way to predict the kind of, or look at and understand the kind of um, timeline or a uh, time to completion that students are engaged in these courses with these activities? In theory, we assign the course readings on, on let's say, a Friday. They have to add uh, annotative readings by, um, the, by Monday, uh, and then they have to release reply to students by Tuesday, and then they discuss it in class on Wednesday or, or along that kind of cycle. That's In theory, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, but it doesn't always come out as cleanly as you think because you can't reply until somebody's annotated, and it kind of goes back and forth. Um, and so here, what you're looking at here is uh, basically the breakdown per day from the total of posts um, with the zero day being the day, the first time somebody annotates the text in the course. So the first time somebody annotates, the first time somebody replies is our zero day on this count. And you can see obviously between days zero and two, the vast majority of the annotations take place. So students are, are quickly coming in, marking up the text and then leaving. Um, as the, the, the sprawls out a little further, you know, we can see the, the replies are spread a little bit more um, you know, and so this tells us, you know, a, a few things in terms of, of the general engagement. The majority of our classes are coming in, doing their three annotations, waiting, coming back, doing their two replies and being done. Um, and it's not uh, not the sustained kind of in and out of the text that, that maybe we had hoped for, but uh, at least it gives us some sense to start. Um, and so the, the, the peaks and valleys here are the numbers here are the total number of posts uh, on a given set for the entire data set, not just for one one class by any means. That'd be a lot of annotation, 6,000 <laughs> on that one point. Um, and so, you you know, this is, we start thinking about, well, this is clearly a product of our of our course design and the pedagogical implementation. You know, we have checkpoints and due dates and things like that. And so we wonder now going forward, can we tweak the model, maybe uh, require the annotations to exist throughout the week and, and, and whatnot. But those are the, the kind of decisions we can make because of the data that we're, we're gathering. Um, most recently, we've been able to start a, really start to get into some of the finer details about the annotations themselves and starting to identify the kind of threads that are that are at play. So um, again, this is just a broad scale overview. Uh, we had 17,608 total annotations from spring 21 in the W131 uh, courses. Um, 11,000 of those or 11,657 were annotations that had no replies to them whatsoever, right? They they just, they are the, their post and nobody touched them or, or engaged in them in any sort of content. Um, but there were a total of 5,879 replies, what we call level one replies. So Ramey made a post and I replied to Ramey, perfect. Uh, and if the Sharice pops back in and she replied to me, that would be a level one post, but if she replied to Ramey's post, that'd be a level two, right? So you can see how these kind of move on down the line. Um, so we had, you know, roughly 5,800 or 5,900 reply annotations across all of our data uh, and, and then only had 72 reply annotations that were level two. So only out of all this data, only 72 times did a student reply to a reply to a post, um, which is at that point, that's an interesting kind of discussion when you think about how this works across them. So we're not we're not getting sustained discussion. We're getting you post, I respond, you post, I respond. Uh, and, and that's, again, not what we're going for. But of these uh, five, eight, seven, nine, plus the 72, right? Of those total annotations, they those total annotations are comprised within 4,188 threads. So quite a few of these level one annotations were in fact, my original post, Ramey replying to me, and then Sharice also replying to me, and then somebody else also replying to me. Um, instead of having a conversation, it's been three three engagements with the top level post, and so you know this uh, we're really kind of excited now that we can see this um, not only identify where the threads live, um, but track their total volume and track them across courses and documents and, and things of that nature. And so this is sort of the most recent development on <laughs> on our end, and it, unfortunately, it just it's taken forever to figure out how to position the data to get it all into the same document to get it scrubbed and clean so we can de-identify it in, in ways that that can be used. Um, 
and it's just it's just way more data than what we can we can actually process. Hopefully, one day we can make this more available to other researchers to make inquiries of our data as well. But we've been using it as a starting point um, to identify subsets to start making more um, targeted inquiries into. And so you can see here, uh, and I'm not gonna. I'll just see if I can tap in so you can see me, uh, zoom in and see it. So this is a breakdown on each individual course, and these are just dummy variables. They don't actually correspond to any actual. I mean, to the actual course number, but it's. Um, so in this one course, right, we had 535 threads for the semester. And uh, however many of those are actually a discussion, we don't know. It's just mostly those level one sort of replies. Um, and you can see that just as you go, it just continues to, this is obviously scaling down. So 535 is our top number of threads in one class. And we go way down here and we have one cla another class that only had 57. Part of this is due to enrollment fluctuations. Not every class has the full 23 uh, students per, per section. Um, and, and some of it is that students just don't actively participate in the assignment. There were lots of times where students were annotating and, and not replying and, and vice versa. And so we, we have the, that kind of stuff. And then last, I'll show you this, even though the numbers aren't there, um, a sort of breakdown of the post and replies uh, per, per course per document. And so we can look at like Deloria here, this text, um, you know, these are the total number of reply, posts and, and replies that the numbers didn't populate for some reason. I have to ask about that. Um, and so this, again, is just another way for us to start to filter these things out. It's not, you know, um, not necessarily earth shattering in terms of like data findings, but it is absolutely essential for us in terms of where do we go next? Uh, a couple of graphs that I don't have here um, and that I will come back to later um, that I can share with you is we've been able to identify, you know, which courses in the 131 class have read which texts and in which order. So there's five different course texts throughout the semester. The fourth one is what we call our keystone essay and students really build off and around that really dense content. Um, and then, you know, they, uh, uh, the question is, can we identify a number of classes that have all read the same document in that fourth slot? And we, we, we have several, we have like, I think the, is it the Anzal Dua reading is read like you know, the McCrary reading, one of our course readings from McCrary is read in nine different classes at the exact same uh, spot in the class. So they have different themes because the instructors choose across a, a bunch of readings of the, in our archive. But um, now we can look at those nine sections and look at not only the, the, the specifically the fourth, the, the fourth reading and all the annotations and look at the different ways in which those students are actively engaged in that reading at that point in the semester and try to make comparisons in a way that um, might, be, might be helpful, might be useful. Again, it's like, I really wish I had like, oh, here's the brilliance of annotation. Here's how it impacts students writing. And that's where I want to go. Or here's the fascinating part about student threads and conversations and here's what it means but um but as of right now what we've been able to do is identify how do we start to ask those questions and create those data subsets to then get into content analysis using computational modeling topic modeling those kind of things um and so that's the that's the basis so chris asked uh curious what tools you're using to pull the data out of your course to analyze it um so we uh we have a data wizard uh as i like to say so it's important to know that um I partner with Hypothesis, but I also partner with the eLearning Research Lab at IU to help us um, provide services to help, uh, you know, de-identify the data, to merge the data sets together in ways that make sense. And de-identification is really problematic because we have to pull students' names out and some names appear in course text and course reading. So there's a whole bunch going uh, on that. Um, from that data, though, we've moved into now working with, I jokingly called him the data wizard. Uh, uh, Canon uh, vendor, uh, uh, undergrad who is volunteering his time to work with us just to learn how to do this stuff has been using Tableau um, and customizing uh, sort of scripted elements to uh, sort through and filter through the data and create the, a lot of these visualizations. The last two, the long flowing, the long flowing ones are, are out of Tableau. Um, and that's a Tableau visualization itself where the earlier ones that I shared are, are ones that I created based on the data we have, um, we, we found in that. Um, so that's sort of that process. And we're, we're trying to do other things like creating hotspots in the text, um, mapping out how to extract the data into subsets. Uh, right now, it's just a lot of data collection, data curation, and, and building a system for us to be able to manage uh, the inquiry. Like it's not, you know, sort of fascinating to think about it as a process because it's, um, you know, I'd hoped it was like, well, look, we got two texts, Ramey. Let's read them and talk about them. <laughs> uh, but we do not have two texts. We have like, what, 79 uh, different unique texts across 51 sections, um, all doing sort of thematic things that are related and sometimes unrelated, um, all around the same set of skills that are supposed to be taught in sequencing order. And so um, 
And then, of course, each semester we've had curriculum changes based on modality. So this data comes completely from an online data set. Everything was online. Um, the, the next set of data, the, the fall 21, has got online and in-person uh, and hybrid modalities. And it's got a slight curriculum change with the way that we ask students to engage in the hypothesis activity, as is the spring. And then in the fall, we'll have a different set of curriculum elements that have evolved around, the, around this kind of engagement. So. Um, that's like the 20,000 foot view. It's like 10 minutes. I don't want to go any longer. I want to let people ask well, questions. Yeah. yeah, thanks. And there's a lot of questions coming in about the specifics of the study that I want to get to. Um, but um, I want to just give a quick update on, on again, dear colleague Sharice McBride, whose entire area is experiencing an internet um, outage right now. So there's just no, and everyone's offline. So uh, we really. Uh, so it's just me today. You got me. Well, we really appreciate her presence. She's actually shared with me um, her slide deck. Um, as well as uh, all of her typed up commentary that she was presenting. And I wanna actually, if it's okay, go back to that because um, in organizing today's session, although again, now it is just, just me and Justin, it's like, our, it's like our research team meetings. Now we're just kind of hanging, hanging back out again for a moment. But um, the reason why I wanted to bring us together is that the two approaches to a researching annotation that are represented by both Dr. McBride's work and Dr. Hodgson's work are really different and both really important. And I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of the advantages of those two different approaches. Um, and so let me just kind of hit a few high level notes and then quickly jump back into her presentation. And then we can kind of get into some of the more specific questions about study design, et cetera. Um, but as we heard from Dr. McBride, she's primarily studying K-12 educators. And I think it's really important to consider and remember that if we're asking students to use technologies, it's really important that we ourselves as educators also know what it feels like and what it looks like to use those technologies as well. And so supporting educators as learners and their familiarity, as she was saying, with these kind of new digital literacies is extremely important. And that, of course, contrasts with what Dr. Hodgins presented to us, which is looking at how, in this case, um, what we might call pretty traditional undergraduate students are using this class, or excuse me, are using social annotation in a required university class. And so an intentional pairing of two very different groups of learners who are engaging in annotation activities for very different reasons. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we do the work. Um, as we were just hearing from Dr. Hodgson's presentation, one of the things that makes our work at IU both very exciting and extremely hard to manage actually is the scale. Um, we know the literature and the landscape pretty well. There isn't to date um, a ongoing research study about annotation as large as what we're trying to bite off here. Um, we were just hearing about our first semester of data collection, 50 some odd sections of, you know, freshman comp, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of annotations. And we have data now from two additional semesters. Um, our data sets will be enormous. And to then briefly address one point of, of, of uh, the chat that I see a question from uh, dear colleague Mo here, there is much, uh, m many other sources of data in the study as well. Um, there are, yeah. there is survey data um, based upon a reliable survey measure. There are um, in interviews and um, questionnaires with instructors. There is artifact collection. There's collection of original essays. There's just so much data in that project. And that's in a very intentional, in, this, in terms of this presentation, contrast um, with the work that, again, Dr. McBride is doing, which is extremely focused on a very, um, really small scale, voluntary group of participants who see the value of developing their professional practice through annotation activities. And so as we think again, and we step back and understand the value of researching social annotation, one of the key things that I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of in this presentation, whatever various, you know, for if you're a, a participant watching now um, or watching later, whomever you may be and whatever your interests are, there's great empirical value in looking at a handful of educators who are reading a text together, who are making meaning of it, who are in this case of Dr. McBride's research, reading texts written by youth, building empathy, considering perspective taking, thinking about the relevance to their pedagogy and using youth generated media and collaborative annotation practices as a means to deepen their professional pedagogical practices. That is an incredibly important locus of empirical investigation, just as it's important to try and glean patterns from 
massively huge data sets, like, again, what we're working with in the context of the IU study. And so the differences in population, the differences in scale, the differences in the kinds of readings that folks are looking at, some of the reasons why I wanted to bring, you know, our, our, our featured speakers into conversation with one another today. So I just want to make sure that we kind of hit on those, those, those high level um, um, comments before I turn back into some additional Q&A. So um, there is a question, and so Justin, we'll turn back to you for just a moment here. Um, there is a question in the Q&A from, from Courtney Gomez. Courtney's asking, I may have okay, missed this. Trying. Yeah, oh, you did in the oh. chat. Okay, group yeah. of students. I was just trying to, wanna, yeah, so we- yeah, Do you want to talk about so that? our course? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a really great question. Um, our, our first year comp courses are typically capped at 23. Um, different versions have different caps, but um, 23 students, but not all the classes ran at a full 23 scale. So I think the lowest was 12 or 14 students in the, the spring uh, some data set. Um, but yeah, they were they were actively annotating across the entirety of the class. We didn't, uh, at, that, at that iteration, we didn't have groups um, <clears throat> as part of the Canvas install with Hypothesis yet, um, but it was meant to be a full class discussion um and as they come into those kind of conversations so that was the, i mean the big one for us was how do we get them to talk to each other and now the question right Raymond, we ask is do the student x only reply to student y <laughs> throughout the semester or is there actually a kind of layered discussion which we can't uh we have yet to to be able to determine um those kind of out, uh, predictive outputs though i know we have access to some of that content so we do and i think that raises another point i guess i'm i'm kind of like <laughs> And again, this is where it's nice to invite friends to talk about the research because I have some sense of what Dr. McBride is doing and researching in her or her work. This is another really important tension that I think is um, worth highlighting in this discussion, again, broadly about social annotation research, which is that if we're asking people to use social annotation as a way of having a conversation, and in this case, we're specifically using them, you know, asking them to use hypothesis, What's the motivation to have a conversation, right? Yeah. You know, what gets people talking to one another? And so, you know, just in the case of the work that you and I are doing together, um, we have a explicit instructional request that students author three individual annotations, and then they reply to their peers twice. And you gave us some of that data where we're beginning to see those replies come in and we can then look qualitatively at the characteristics of those conversations. We can, for example, see if students are constructing knowledge together, if they're actually engaging with diverse perspectives, if they're listening through their annotations. But we can't ignore the fact that there is an, ins an explicit instructional requirement. And that varies. And I'm going to see if I can share my screen here and um, Looks like I've got to do a little bit of uh, finagling on on my end as well. Um, <laughs> and actually, it looks like Sharice has kind of come back in and joined us here. So I'll let, I'll let her do this. But it varies from the context that she was presenting to us here, which is to say, we have a small group of educators. And they are choosing to pick up this particularly um, interactive and intuitive social annotation technology because they see it's valuable to their own learning. And so the characteristics of their conversation will be markedly different as they use hypothesis to advance their learning than in some cases, freshmen at IU. And so I think we need to be um, appreciative of the differences in the kinds of social contexts, the kinds of explicit requests or requirements for annotation when we then go to make claims about how people use this technology and how they learn. Well, you know, in, in, in our own context, right? Uh, so the data we're looking at has a very explicit, like, please do this many of this kind. <laughs> and we usually have question prompts to, to figure out, to guide them into the kind of in inquiry because we wanted to help them understand different ways of engaging the text. That's that's the goal, right? The, the primary goal. The secondary goal is this peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, but then in, in the fall, right, the next semester, that, that model, the first model was built around like your five points for completing the task. This model now is rolled into a different kind of um, incentivization, right? So it's still point-based, but it's not explicit. And so now it's it's a matter of, a, it's part of a larger ecology in which students are operating in for the newer, the newer design. Um, so I, I'm fascinated to see if we get more interaction in, this, in the next set of data because the, 
the the parameters were not as like explicitly instructional. It became like you need to do these. You, they still need to do five annotations, but the 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 process and the order and the one to one sort of point correlation is no longer evident. So um, I think that as you even just change something simple like that, like the the, the operative dynamics of the inquiry is going to going to going to shift the, the way that behavior works. At least that's my that's my thought. All right, that's my my hypothesis, as they would say. Right. So um, absolutely, it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's really fascinating the context and how the behaviors are just radically different depending on where you're at, what you're doing, what your con what your situation is. So yeah, so I want to actually pick up on. I want to bring. I actually I think that Sharice may be rejoining us, if she's she's literally I think driving or commuting somehow to a place that's not blacked out by internet right now. So I hope she rejoins us in a moment here, but I actually want to bring a quote of hers back into the conversation to share with you, Justin, um, because I think this is really fascinating in your context. And again, I think this is such um, there's just such great value in saying, hey, there's this thing called social annotation. We know from research, quote unquote, whatever that looks like, however the methods we use, it's valuable, productive, but the social context varies so widely. So here's something that she said when she was presenting to us earlier. She said, the author is a function that is open. And my sense, again, from having done work with her, is that educators particularly literacies educators, both K-12 higher ed, certainly have a clear sense of that, that the author is not always the authority and that the author's perspectives and claims can be contested. And that something like commentary and specifically hypothesis annotation is a way of making that function open. And I'm wondering, Justin, as you hear that and you think about that, what does that look like for an 18, 19, even 20 year old student at IU? Do we see in the work that you're doing? And I know that, you know, the focus of your presentation today was primarily on the 131 class, which is a freshman level class, although we've also collected data and we've also been doing um, some smaller scale um, collection and analysis of work from higher level courses within the English department that are more specific like poetry and etc et yeah. do we have a sense that students are also embracing the idea that the author as a function is open that they can speak back to the author as a way of catalyzing their learning yeah that's a good question um <laughs> well the question i would say do you mean it pedagogically or uh are, are we like, for example, it's hard to teach a writing class and when you have students do readings, critical readings that they're going to build from and not also include things like make an inquiry of the author. The author is not the definitive source. The author is a perspective from which we operate. And how do you position those thinking? How are they how are they positioning their thinking? Right. So the rhetorical elements of uh, and the rhetorical function of the author is sort of front and center in a lot of the the kind of activities that our students are asked to do because it's a the class is heavily built in analysis. Right. That's. The way that again it's not my curriculum it's just i built it up for the online delivery right so um so for good or bad the the five texts uh all primarily revolve around critical analysis in some capacity so i think that on the one hand uh is a fundamental drive of the, the class but what i what i do think we've seen in some of the and again this is you know there's some data that we can share as like part of the research we put out but then there's also things that i'm exposed to as a program as a programmatic level of review. And so what I do know is true across a lot of our course evals, when we analyze those for programmatic purposes, um, there's an incredible layer of enthusiasm for hypothesis as a tool, right? Um, and students comment on on things like how much easier it was to make to make an inquiry of the text or how much easier it was to try and see uh, find ways to challenge ideas in the text and their commentary on it. Again, that's not uh, it's not part of our survey analysis. It's part of like this, that kind of feedback. And some instructors would add their own questions to the course evals, like, how did you like this tool? Because, you know, some instructors didn't like it initially. <laughs> and so they were trying to find a way to, to get it out of the classroom. Uh, since then, though, it's, it's we, we, again, we've adopted it even further at scale because people have been so excited. But so I, I don't, that's like, it's not evident in the content we've been analyzed yet, but, you know, it's sort of the things that I've seen as a programmatic level of assessment, and then just the principles we teach, it's kind of hard to avoid um, the author function as, as a part of that inquiry. And I think the tool itself, just the act of annotating in a collective allows you to discuss and, and question and or push ideas from an author in a way that doesn't feel as isolated as when you're just doing it at home by yourself in the margins of a book. Right. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And teaching those key dispositions is so is so important. Um, absolutely. So I'm, I guess I'm also really curious. Whether they get there or not, it's another story. <laughs> well, no, I think so, this, is, this uh, opens up the complexity, Justin, because you and I and our team more broadly have had a lot of conversations as we get, you know, dig deeper from, again, our extensive data collection phases into our analysis. Um, because we understand that there are learning environments where the formality of the environment is such that we have these kind of broad instructional goals, right? We want students to learn to engage with discipline specific practices. We want them to take away kind of key, um, you know, you know, key insights, whatever that may be. And so we have those in mind as we design pedagogy curriculum and of course use learning technologies, maybe like hypothesis to pursue those goals. And at the same time, we know that a tool like hypothesis and again, annotation more broadly is kind of open-ended, right? We're kind of asking students to kind of go out there and make meaning. And so there's inevitably a little bit of tension there between how they show up in the texts and how that aligns with, you know, our goals. And then of course we can yeah. choose to research you know, that, what, that, the, the, that fit. One of my favorite examples, and I don't remember this early on in the data, um, there's a class where somebody was at the, the students were responding to one of the early texts and it was about uh, synthesis, synthesizing or comparative and comparative analysis. That's what it was. Right. And the text was, um, I think it was one of Gloria Anzaldua's piece on, on Spanglish and coming to language. And all of a sudden in the middle of the text, in the middle of the annotation is a link to um, or is an embedded uh, advertisement for like hot dogs. Right. But it's not like a real company. It's like the student made a graphic in like a program and then just put it into the comments. So, you know, like, like the open endedness uh, also invites kind of fascinating other, <laughs> other issues. I like the multimedia, but like, it, you know, we were joking because it had no, there was no, no contextual reason for why this was there. <laughs> and so like those kind of things are always fascinating to me too. It's like, always, do do always fascinating. <laughs> well, I think we may have Dr. McBride back with us. And again, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you're here. Um, for hanging with us. I am so sorry that there were so many kind of tech challenges at a cafe that has internet. Oh my goodness. Hey. I am so embarrassed. I'm really oh, sorry, you all. Not um, your fault. Not, it's where you're here. It's I fantastic. Just, Let me tell you, I just actually took one of your quotes from your presentation early and actually asked Justin about this, about kind of how the author as a function opens up text. And Justin was riffing a little bit about how students in his context um, you know, do or don't kind of pick up on that critical aspect. And I, and I recognize that again, because of the, you know, internet snafus there that you didn't have a full chance to see, you know, all of Dr. Hodgson's presentation, but I want to bring, bring you back in, Sharice, and I want to kind of tee you up with a question that I know you care a lot about and that speaks, you know, greatly to your work, um, you know, which is returning to the idea that your work with annotation and the importance of annotation to educator learning is happening in a kind of less formal learning environment. And yet there's great rich insight that we can glean about how people learn outside of the kind of formal constraints of the classroom. And I would just love to hear you speak a little bit more about the fact that there's a lot to learn about annotation and learning when we embrace these types of everyday reading and writing practices and when we see in the case of your research educators engaging deeply with, with topics of interest topics you know of interest that are written by youth and can you just speak to like why it's important to really advance research about annotation and learning that is connected to the classroom but is not necessarily always happening inside the classroom what does that do for people's engagement and people's annotation and their learning. Yeah, well, thanks for asking that. I mean, as I was saying, I think that teaching and, and teacher learning um, is often really social, collaborative, public in some ways. Um, and the opportunity to dig into text with other people can be powerful because I think that's a practice that teachers often do on their own anyway. Um, teachers are excellent, you know, at seeking out resources and putting things together in sort of a bricolage of, of what they're doing. But it, it's it's so much more, um, it, I think it can be really generative when folks are able to do that together and to do it in a way where there's sort of a transcript or 
um, a, a repository of resources that they can then refer to and what they've created together. Um, in terms of creating curriculum too, um, teachers are able, that's that's part of our goal is that as as they do these annotations and make it, make their thinking visible, they eventually build curriculum that can be shared with other teachers. And then that curriculum can be remixed um, in, in ways that are always situated, you know, to the context that folks who do that work um, in, in ways that they desire. And so um, I think those, those elements of it being social and situated are really made um, really there are affordances within social annotation that allow us to to build on that rather than a sort of you know top down mandating of what teachers do and this is an out of school space i mean teachers sign up voluntarily i'm always i, I just feel honored that they're willing to listen to these ideas and then share their feedback and kind of engage in conversation with us because they don't have to right but they the fact that they've opted in to these experiences i think also um, build, we're able to build from that, you know, and, and engage them um, in ways they want to be engaged. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, so now that you're back, uh, Sharice, and again, oh my goodness, thank you for like schlepping and finding internet despite the outage. Uh, yeah, heroic. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, I want to, I had this question in my back pocket, and now that we're, we're all here, I really want to ask this to the both of you because I think that you both know that. I am increasingly interested in the relationship between annotation and critical literacies, broadly defined, critical perspectives on text, critical engagement with peers, maybe critique, again, of authority. And it strikes me that it's entirely feasible, and we maybe see this in some formal course contexts, that social annotation becomes pretty similar to a discussion forum, right? That maybe the discussion isn't really deep or the kinds of ways that we ask students to pick up this technology are not particularly innovative, even though we're using these really interesting technologies. And yet I have a hunch and I'm increasingly, again, interested in exploring how, because we're using an annotation technology and we're using it in a social way, and we're using it in a way that allows us to speak to the text, but also to our peers, that it allows us to move into these kinds of critical discursive spaces in more substantive ways. And of course, Sharice, in the work that you and I have been doing, we've given that a name, this justice-oriented media literacy. We've begun to look at that more explicitly. But I also know, Justin, in the work that you and I are doing, that we talk a lot about the fact that these are freshmen showing up at Indiana University. Maybe they don't know who Gloria Enzaldúa is. Maybe they've never read a text by Roxane Gay before. And now all of a sudden, they're not only engaging with this content, they're doing so with their peers using social annotation. And we have data on that. We can look at their conversations, engaging with one another for the first time. And I'd love to hear you both talk about how you perceive the ways in which social annotation opens up new, more critical types of conversation and inquiry as relevant either to freshmen or to educators. Sharice has been gone the longest, so she gets to go first. <laughs> Sure. I was actually looking back at some of our annotations to see if I could pull up an example. Um, we also use crowd layers. I heard you talking about that, Justin, you know, just to kind of see. And I shared this with the teachers as a tool they might use in their practice. I don't have I'm not sure if folks are anyone has used it um, among the groups that I've worked with yet. But um, I, I think <clears throat> what, what's interesting, and I, I don't know if you got to see the part of my presentation where I I talk about the kinds of annotation that I am seeing teachers do, which include um, commenting on youth as authors themselves, commenting on the content that the youth have brought up, and then commenting on their own like teaching practices and how they might implement these ideas. Those are just kind of three big buckets that I'm noticing so far. And I think all of those spaces allow room for critique, right? Um, or engagement in a way that reads against the grain um, of, for example, in the, in the teaching area, 
Um, some teachers will, we actually read an article from the marginal syllabus um, and I, I saw comments in the, in the margins around um, how this is, you know, critiquing the practice that they saw happening there. Um, <clears throat> that I see a note here from one saying, this is not a best practice. It doesn't align with the sort of dynamic collaborative classroom that I've been taught we should be cultivating. And this is a relatively um, new teacher, I remember. And someone else, another teacher replied, agreed, although sometimes it is necessary. So I think there's a conversation beginning there that's critical of practice, you know, um, and can be useful for teachers across, you know, spectrum, the spectrum of experience. But also um, we see even the critique of, of authorship and who wrote this. I mean, those things definitely come up um, in, in the margins. Um, and I, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity across those areas um, to engage critical literacy, you know, critical literacy, critical pedagogy, and thinking, thinking twice, again, making thinking visible, thinking twice about our practice and, and opening that space to discuss. Yeah, sorry, let me, let me turn my mic back on. I, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> There's a lot that, uh, you know, this, I would say that the tool alone does not foster critical literacy, right? Um, no tool on its own does the work. Uh, and, and as much as I would like to think that just adding hypothesis made for a more critical, engaged sort of reading um, or awareness of, of these things, um, you know, nothing nothing so far suggests that on its own is doing that. But, um, but the opportunity that comes with being able to engage with an author or an idea or your peers, or, or in this case, if it's a, a teacher's looking at something else as an assessment of somebody's work, right? And to anchor that into, into the text and to do that in real time, that's not just your, again, not just your own margin marginalia, but a sort of public facing thing where you think about your comments as crafted, as real, even with the first draft thinking, that's still create, you know, a real kind of thing. Um, you know, that uh, it, it invites the opportunity uh, in, a, in a way far, far better than just saying, hey, go read this and come back to class and have a discussion, like at least for our, our first year program. Um, because it's just reading in isolation is not at all how one becomes aware of, of otherness, of difference, of margin and marginalization, right? Like, I mean, I think you can get exposed to a lot of ideas, but, uh, and become more aware, I guess I should say you probably, you know, that's true, but the conversations that happen around something like Anza Aldua's breaking down of the different levels of, of Mestizo and, and how she talks about language, um, and her coming to language, um, and then to see the students trying to engage in that. You know whether they're like a you know poor rural kid from you know the hick, hick parts of Indiana, like I was a small you know small town small time kid, or whether they're from a, you know different 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 race, different ethnicity, different whatever. It doesn't matter that the space is available for a kind of inquiry and an opportunity. So what then we have to figure out, and this is where we struggled, I think, in the first go round, um, is better ways of fostering that kind of engagement and. We've actually seen it done incredibly well in our, our literature courses because the instructors there had more autonomy in how they scaffolded their activities, but also were actively invested in, in the, the, the role the annotation was playing. And so I think at the freshman level, because of our scale, uh, what we accomplished was actually quite good for what we wanted, but it, it didn't hit this kind of next level engagement that requires that, you know, I always say teaching is, is it's, it's people first, right? And it's pedagogy focused and purpose driven. So um, the tool doesn't matter. Um, but if the tool creates a new opportunity for the, the pedagogical focus and the purpose, um, then, then we really open up the possibilities. And so that's for me, I know Raymond, we've talked about this a little bit, hopefully in future iterations, we get much better at this and we can look at like, you know, five or six different sections of, of students from Indiana, historically not, uh, you know, historically white sort of oriented state. And, you know, it's got a, a sorted history for a lot of reasons. Um, at least in the Bloomington campus in the southern part of the areas, uh, and, and and see how they are actively engaging with something like Anzo Do or Roxane Gay or these what you know what is commonly thrown under the critical race theory framework or umbrella whatever that is, um, and to see what we can figure out from that. But it's it still starts with what is the pedagogy that's helping them get there, or who is the teacher, uh, and how are they prompting the conversation? So it's not the same kind of analysis of their work, but it's. It's the opportunity to push them in that way. Does that, does that make sense? I know it's it's sort of a broad spectrum answer, um, but it, it's sort of where we fall because it, the tool on its own didn't it did not have the impact that we thought it was going to have. It had an impact, absolutely, um, and we don't know how how far it's gone in terms of their writing, but 
that kind of critical reading. We saw a bunch of students pick up with it in really wonderful ways and come to class and be upset that, you know, we already had this conversation. Why are we doing this again <laughs> with the instructor? And then others who who were like, well, I did my five, leave me alone. <laughs> so it's it's just a too big of a, a box to fit in right now. Well, but. And I think that's probably what prompts some of my question here. And I, first of all, thank you both for, for those really, I, I think for me, I'm still taking notes, provocative answers. And I think that it's almost too easy to try and research whether or not a particular learning technology like has some measurable gain outcome something maybe it works maybe it doesn't and i'm just going to say like that kind of research starts to bore me pretty quickly it tends to reify certain ways in which we hold to you know to dr mcbride to your points earlier you know about like whose knowledge and authority and voice matters in these particular learning environments and so what I find, again, particularly compelling about how both of your works open up new avenues for research, we, for example, see an alternative approach to what it means to design professional development in the case of your work, Dr. McBride, right, right? And like, how do we get educators reading, discussing, and learning from youth experience? You know what can help us? Social annotation. It provides that initial entry point to have then those rich conversations that are relevant to their pedagogy. And then to the point that you were just making a few moments ago, you know, uh, into the into the context of the IU work, you know, Justin, it's this question of, do we see students having new kinds of conversations in new ways because there has been an intentional approach to the ways in which students are encountering perspectives that they've not encountered before. And if that's the case, maybe it doesn't matter that this, you know, technology does or does not help raise their grade by two or three percentage points, maybe it's a opportunity for them to become more critically engaged thinkers, discussants, you know, and peers, you know, for, for, for their classmates. Um, so in any case, I find both of your, you know, studies in this respect so, um, so helpful. So if I can, been, I, please, please, please. I would just yes. like to say a brief thing, which about the criticality and where it comes in for me, I think in the design of how I'm imagining teachers coming in with these questions uh, and how we shape the annotation. Um, we, we explicitly ask questions around what do the artifacts that we're looking at reveal about youth strengths, for example. Um, we're starting from a place of asset, you know, an asset orientation and that in itself is part of the critical element for me in making sure that our teachers, I mean, you hear so many deficit framings of, of um, the youth that we're working with, um, youth of color, queer youth, um, youth who come from backgrounds of poverty, um, you, you hear what they don't have, what they're, what they're not bringing, what they're not able to do. I mean, I don't even like, it's not, I, I do my best to start from a different place um, to say, we're gonna share thoughts about what, is, what the richness is, the abundance that we see in this work. Um, and we're gonna also work from the assumption that they are, offering critical thought, powerful commentary. And so I ask those questions, like what issues, values, and perspectives are they offering commentary on? Widening our apertures to see what learning is already happening. Um, and rather than Im immediately trying to map what they're doing onto what um, like standards that we may have, just asking open questions and then connecting it to our practice. So. I think that's the critical element for me, um, given the history of deficit framings um, of education and or that happen in education of particular groups of youth. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us back to this. I really appreciate this. So thank thank you. Um, we did get a question um, uh, from uh, Chris Aldrich. Uh, good to have you here, Chris. And I, I will admit that I'm not perhaps particularly familiar with um, the context of the question. But it is in the Q&A asking, how might we better encourage tumbling? And again, I'm not as, as familiar with this particular reference as I could be. But here's what at least it sparks in my mind, having just very quickly looked at that reference, which I think that both both of our, our guests can speak to, um, which I'd be really curious about what you're seeing in your various projects um, and how in your research you're seeing evidence that annotation allows learners, again, whether educators or students, to write for different kinds of audiences and to perhaps write in more private spaces for their peers, but to also use that annotation writing to support other forms of discourse, whether it's, again, their conversations with colleagues about their practice, or in the case of uh, maybe their own writing for essays or for assignments, and how 
we're seeing the ways in which annotation allows for multiple kinds of writing beyond just the immediate reader response to a text. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't, I mean, again, I'll have to dive into the, the tumbling thing in much more depth to, to probably offer a, a more substantive answer. But I know that something we've, we've increasingly had conversations around are things like digital empathy, digital ethics, digital engagement um, as a framework across IU. And uh, I think, you know, there is a kind of um, an audience centric nature to annotation, when, uh, to social annotation, right? That is not present when it's just <laughs> private annotation. Um, and in that regard, it, it in many ways invites, um, uh, it's a rhetorical space, right? Uh, you're posting something others are going to read, whether it's just for you or not, it doesn't matter, others are gonna read it. And so by design, then it, it typically leads to a more crafted uh, thing. Like it's, you know, I always think about the difference between like my photos on my phone versus my photos on Instagram. <laughs> they, they've definitely been polished before they hit Instagram. Uh, and so there's, there's a layer of that. Um, but I think we've seen a little bit with students, and I've seen it in students writing, um, um, increasingly an attentiveness to this kind of uh, willingness to put oneself out there. Their ideas, their identities, their selfhood. Like, you know, I, we always say we, we write from the personal. It doesn't matter what kind of writing it is. You can't get rid of yourself, you know. So there there is some of that going on, um, I think, as a part of the process. But I don't know to what extent we, you know, like as a, an intentional design thing, it, it's not, not in that conversation. But. Yeah, I just think it's it's it it is that's created an interesting conversation around like um what you know you always call it first draft thinking right I mean it's your you know thing um are you willing to put your first draft thinking in front of your peers it's, uh, you know it's, those are kind of challenges yeah I think that's an especially risky move um, for teachers right and with <laughs> whether it's issues of surveillance or even um, that peer kind of eye on us and what are we doing is it good enough like those kinds of questions and it I can go back to I mean this is a question I want to keep thinking about what kind of writing does this afford or connect to but but I think just the conditions for writing are something that we need to pay attention to um, we know that in in social media spaces or in these spaces of public thinking there's a lot of pressure um, and there's a need to and there, there's also this history of, um, you know, negativity and critique and, and unhelpful critique and um, hate speech and things like that that can happen. So another frame that that um, I've thought about with colleagues Anna Smith and Chris Rogers is humanizing discourses of collegiality, um, particularly. And I think collegiality is not just in a teacher or a professional sense, but also among students. Like, what are the moves that we can make with one another? For example, um, moves that encourage experimentation rather than a sense of, um, you know, correctness or having to do things the right way. Um, I think emphasizing certain, emphasizing those as values and then also making mechanisms for uh, an, another example, we, we had this spectra of like nurturing and, um, and welcoming um, rather than sort of a in, uh, closed, you know, a, a closed community. So there's these different continua that we looked at to identify, you know, that or to categorize what we saw as these humanizing moves rather than what what can sometimes happen in social media spaces that honestly turns a lot of people off from it. You know, in our pre-service teacher courses, I was just speaking with my colleague, Michelle Wilkerson, um, in the curriculum and instruction, curriculum instruction technology course that we've taught in the past, our pre-service teachers are actually really, um, averse you know they don't they don't want to use social media in their courses um and so it's a balancing act of like explaining um you know and demonstrating some of the affordances and also demonstrating that we will take care to mitigate um some of the risks but it takes a lot of contextual like condition setting <laughs> to make this work happen and i i imagine that's why some folks just kind of say you know i don't want to take the risk even as an educator but I think it's important for issues of justice and, and having these hard conversations. Yeah. Speaking of having amazing conversations <laughs> and really struggling through some stuff, Sharice, Dr. McBride, thank you so much <laughs> for hanging with us today. 
uh, and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us despite all the technical difficulties. Really appreciate it, uh, Justin, Dr. Hodgson. Thank you as well. Um, I really appreciate the two of you as friends and colleagues. I know that people who have technical skills um, you know, are many and that there are, again, so many people who can easily implement learning technologies to do all kinds of things. Um, but I learned from the both of you because you're constantly asking big, compelling, challenging questions about why we're doing this work and who we're doing this work with and how we design that work for consequential learning. Again, whether we're working with educators or with students in school, out of school, with a whole range of texts. And what makes my investment in the scholarship that we've done together and the projects that we do together so steadfast is the care that you bring to the work, your ethical commitments to really putting first our learners and their well being. And I just so much appreciate your presence here today and your willingness to share your, your expertise with us. Um, I know this will be recorded for other folks to, to pick up in the future. We can circulate resources as well. Uh, I just want to thank everybody who showed up. We had pretty consistent um, participation and attendance throughout the entire session. So thanks to everyone who, who hung around. Um, again, my thanks to all of our Hypothesis colleagues who behind the scenes have been making sure that all the tech has been working out as smoothly um, as it can. And uh, you're all, of course, very welcome to follow up with all of our guests. It's easy to find Dr. McBride on social media. It's easy to find Dr. Hodgson on social media. Their papers are out there. Their research is out there. Um, read their stuff, follow their stuff, follow these projects. They're really at the cutting edge of what's making critical and creative social annotation research possible. My, thank yous, my thanks to you both. Um, really appreciate your contributions today. And thank you to, again to everyone who was able to show up. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, so much. Enjoy the rest of the Social Learning Summit.